Okay, so today, um, so first of all, my name is Tom Hernandez. I'm a physician assistant or a PA in cardiology um, here at CMH. So um, today I'm going to talk about what heart failure is, what causes it, um, and really try and focus on how cardiac rehab is beneficial in heart failure. We'll touch a little bit on the medicines that we use and different therapies. Um, and then we'll have some time at the end to answer any questions you have about heart failure, which is a very common reason a lot of people end up in cardiac rehab. So first of all, let's start just by defining it. Has anyone here ever heard of heart failure? Yeah? Okay, yeah. You either heard of it or you're experiencing it yourself, right? So um, it's a clinical syndrome caused by either impairment of the structure of the heart or how the heart's functioning. And so you need two things. You need uh, both abnormal heart function as well as symptoms of heart failure. So I abbreviated heart failure to HF, and I'll do that throughout the presentation. But that's a very important bit because people who have abnormal heart function without symptoms, uh, that's considered a cardiomyopathy. Heart failure is actually having symptoms from that abnormal heart function. And so what are the symptoms of heart failure? Well, the heart is acting like a pump, sending uh, blood and fluid through your body. So when that pump is not working, <coughs> then you'll have things like fluid retention. And so how that shows up is in several different ways. One is uh, shortness of breath. Um, one uh, common sign of that is if when you lay down flat, that makes you short of breath. We have a medical term for that. It's called orthopnea. Uh, ortho meaning straight or like, like you're lying flat. Um, so when you lay down, the fluid from um, heart failure uh, starts to build up on the lungs and makes people short of breath. So that's a common sign of heart failure. Similarly, um, waking up in the middle of the night gasping for air, okay, that's another uh, common uh, sign of heart failure or symptom of heart failure. And then lower leg swelling or edema, as it's called, where your legs swell up, that's another sign uh, potentially of heart failure. And then rapid weight gain, that's a pretty common sign. So more than three pounds in 24 hours or more than five pounds uh, over the course of one week, that suggests <coughs> that the weight gain is from you holding onto fluid. And uh, also you can have a rapid heart rate and then a nighttime cough, similarly um, from that increased fluid retention. And so how do we measure uh, the heart's function and the heart structure, well, the, uh, what we use is something called an echocardiogram, which you have probably had done before. That's basically an ultrasound of your heart. We can see what the heart looks like. We can get an idea of the heart's function. Um, and then structural heart disease, uh, that includes either the left or the right side of the heart having uh, reduced function. Um, and one of the ways we uh, measure the heart's uh, function is what we call an ejection fraction. And the form you have here in front of you actually breaks down what is ejection fraction and uh, how we um, measure it. So to put it simply, um, it is a ratio. The denominator is the amount of blood in the heart chamber. Uh, and the numerator is the amount of blood pumped out, okay? We're gonna talk a little bit more about the ejection fraction later. Um, other abnormalities, enlargement of the heart muscle, which is called hypertrophy. You may have heard that term brought up before. Um, the actual, ch the chamber of the heart can dilate as well. That's another structure abnormality. There can be motion abnormalities in the walls of the heart. Um, and then abnormalities in the heart valves as well. So that ejection fraction, um, as uh, written down there for you, the amount of blood pumped out divided by the total amount of blood in the heart chamber. So normal is more than 50 to 55%, okay? Uh, it's mid-range ejection fraction is 41 to 49%, and then it's considered reduced ejection fraction once you're e once it's 40% uh, or below. And that's important because a lot of the research on the medicines is based on uh, how people were categorized, is based on their ejection fraction. And so certain medicines 
have more evidence that they're beneficial at certain levels of ejection fraction. We have the most data in reduced ejection fraction. So um, again, how we classify heart failure. For those of you with heart failure, you may have heard the different categorizations of heart failure. So there's heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And uh, if you're at 40% or less, then we say you have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. If you have 41 to 49, then that's referred to as heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. And then there's heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where you're at 50% or more. And again, that's important because it tells us what uh, medicines and therapies are most likely to be beneficial in your situation. So then um, part of uh, getting the diagnosis of heart failure is trying to figure out what's causing it. Um, there are a lot of causes, and sometimes even after we do uh, several tests, the uh, ultimate cause is not completely known. Um, it's called idiopathic, but we try our best to try and figure it out because if we can find a cause that's reversible, then that can help your heart function recover. So I'll start with the common causes. One is something called coronary artery disease. Okay, so that's where there's um, disease in the arteries that give blood and oxygen to your heart muscle, the arteries that sit on top of your heart. Um, now, when someone has a heart attack, for example, that is blockage of a coronary artery disease. So when people experience heart attacks, they're experiencing something on the spectrum of coronary artery disease. Um, and so when you have that blocked oxygen and blood flow from, say, a heart attack, that can hurt the heart muscle. And if the heart muscle is hurt, then it could lead to a cardiomyopathy and heart failure. So it's kind of a sort of cause and effect going on. And um, if you can treat the coronary artery disease, sometimes people's heart function improves. Um, high, chronic severe high blood pressure can lead to heart failure. Um, valvular heart disease can cause heart failure. So those are some of the more common causes. But there's a really long list of many things that can cause heart failure or cardiomyopathy. Um, so alcohol, methamphetamine, cocaine, chronic use of those things can cause um, heart failure. Cancer treatment, whether chemo or radiation can cause it. If uh, you have a chronically rapid heart rate, particularly in atrial fibrillation, so atrial fibrillation with a really fast heart rate um, can cause heart failure. And then um, premature ventricular beats or early beats um, coming from the ventricle. If you have uh, many of those happening frequently, it can actually cause your um, heart to go into heart failure. Um, for people who have um, pacemakers, um, the, if there's excessive pacing of the right side of the heart, that can cause um, heart failure or cardiomyopathy. There's a new um, way to have a pacemaker in your heart, which we'll talk about a little bit later, that um, can address that and, and reverse that potentially. There's also a stress-induced cardiomyopathy, also called a Takasubo cardiomyopathy. So uh, when people are in severe, often emotional distress, you, if you get enough of a surge of stress hormones, that can affect the heart and actually cause a uh, basically part of the heart to balloon out. And when people first present, the, it looks and acts a lot like a heart attack. Uh, but once you do more studies, you see that the, it wasn't a heart attack, it was something else. The interesting thing about this one is it rapidly resolves. So people will have a hospitalization for a stress cardiomyopathy, um, be very ill at that time, and then you repeat your studies one to three months later, and everything should resolve if it was, in fact, a stress cardiomyopathy most of the time. Pregnancy can cause a cardiomyopathy. Myocarditis or inflammation of the heart muscle, um, often caused by viruses, um, can cause uh, reduced heart function. Certain autoimmune diseases, and then what we call infiltrative disease. So diseases where, for example, there's abnormalities in the production of protein or misfolding of protein. If you can think of the heart muscle, if you have abnormal protein in there, it'll start to um, basically kind of deform what's going on there and affect the function. 
Um, so things like sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, those can cause those. Um, having extremely high levels of iron, some people have certain uh, conditions where their body's producing too much iron, and that can cause, uh, can reduce your heart function, thyroid disease. Um, there are genetic and familial cardiomyopathies, things that run in families. Um, and then there's several subcategories of uh, endocrine, endocrine related diseases, metabolic and nutritional diseases. Okay, so there's a long list of things that can cause heart failure. Um, but really what the focus on um, most of the time once you've done several investigational studies is what we can do to treat the heart failure. Uh, can we help the heart function improve? Um, and so these are kind of a simplified view of sort of the four um, pillars of uh, management for heart failure. The most important is the medicines that have been, is starting medicines that have been proven to add years to people's lives uh, and can help the heart function improve. We'll talk a, briefly about those medicines. Uh, depending on your ejection fraction, your, um, uh, that will tell you what medicines you should be on, okay? Uh, and then for uh, diuretics, those have not been really proven to add years to individuals' lives uh, or reduce mortality, uh, early death, uh, but they can help with symptoms, especially if you're holding on to that fluid. Taking some of the fluid off is gonna help your heart uh, function as a pump better to keep things circulating, keep you less short of breath, not having that edema. Um, and then this one, uh, cardiac rehab to improve quality of life. And we'll talk a little bit more about the other benefits of cardiac rehab too. So, um, and I think it's just important to keep in mind that, you know, what you're doing here in cardiac rehab really has been shown and proven mainly to make you feel better. And I think it's great that, you, you know, you invest this time, make yourself feel better, have better functional capacity to kind of live your life and enjoy your life. Whereas the medicines and the diuretic you know, that's important for making your heart function better. That's important for, um, you know, adding years to your life. But in terms of the quality of your life, cardiac rehab is, gonna, is one of the best things when we're talking about heart failure. And then if we identify an underlying cause of the heart failure, um, treating that underlying cause. So for example, people with heart attacks, treating um, the coronary artery disease, we can see an improvement in your heart function sometimes. So uh, just briefly, this is uh, probably more relevant for a healthcare provider like myself or um, a cardiology provider you see, but these are the uh, medicines shown to add years to life or reduce mortality, particularly in people who have reduced ejection fraction. So the first group we call ACEs, ARBs, or ARNIs. Some common names you may have heard because they're also blood pressure medicines are lisinopril or losartan, a new medicine, um, that's a combination medicine called Entresto, um, has recently been added to the guidelines, shown to be beneficial. A beta blocker, for example, metoprolol. Um, a MRA, for example, spironolactone. Um, and then an SGLT2 inhibitor like Jardiance, also called empagliflozin. That's also a diabetes medicine, um, but it's been shown to have uh, several benefits in heart failure. So it's becoming um, more and more prevalent in the medicines people take for heart failure. I'm number three, excuse me, but mm -hmm. what, what does that do? The spironolactone. Mm -hmm. So what that is, is called a potassium sparing diuretic. So basically it's a mild diuretic um, and uh, it can raise the potassium levels a little bit, um, but uh, is it, like the other medicines here, um, just I, without getting too much into the details, basically in heart failure, your, uh, there's a system in your body um, called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, so, but just to answer your question, so that system tends to go in overdrive in heart failure. And a lot of these medicines are counteracting that to get your body more to a kind of healthier state. And so this is acting on one part of that system that's on overdrive and heart failure. Yep, and these are all gonna be acting at different levels of that system in your body. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and then also hydralazine and nitrate um, has been shown to be particularly beneficial in self-identified African-American patients. 
Um, so that is also that um, it, in addition to this baseline of medications for self-identified African-American individuals, um, that pairing of medicines um, has been shown to improve survival. And then uh, advanced heart failure therapies like devices sometimes come into play for people who are on, on all the medicines. We've done all the studies, uh, we've treated as much as we can, and yet they have persistent um, dysfunction of their heart. Um, well, one thing to consider, when people's ejection fraction is 35% or lower, um, there's good evidence that the risk of su <coughs> sudden cardiac de death increases. And so uh, something you can do uh, as a potentially <coughs> life-saving therapy is um, an ICD, so an implanted cardioverter defibrillator. And so when you see the movies or when you see someone doing CPR, they often have a defibrillator, those pads. And so what this is is a small device implanted for when people go into a malignant rhythm, uh, it can shock them out of that and potentially save someone's life. So um, that's something to talk about, right? Is uh, if the uh, heart function's low, you've done all the things you can, you're on all the medicines, is an ICD indicated? And then uh, the other thing, earlier we talked about that pacing, when you have too much right ventricle or right side of the heart pacing, um, it can cause dysfunction of your heart. Well, something uh, that has come out more recently is called cardiac resynchronization ther therapy. And so that adds a lead and basically it helps the heart function more like a normal healthy heart would beat. Okay, and so that's called cardiac resynchronization therapy. Sometimes it's offered to individuals. You have to meet certain criteria and that criteria is uh, what has been basically puts you in a group of people where we've seen proven benefit. So um, that's something that your provider may talk to you about, depending on uh, where you are on the spectrum of heart failure. Um, yes. Is it possible to raise your, um, your rejection fraction? It is, yes, yep. We see that sometimes. We see that in several different situations. Um, one common situation is if the underlying cause um, is reversible. So coronary artery disease. Uh, if you have blockage in a blood vessel and we're able to open that up either by a stent or through a graft um, and get blood flow back to the heart muscle, well, we can see that some of that heart muscle recovers function. The other thing is some people come in with a certain level of ejection fraction and then we get them on all those medicines we were mentioning and we see an improvement. And so that's why we really advocate starting those medicines um, because it's something that we can see improvement in ejection fraction. Usually, yes. Usually uh, they're chronic medicines because, you know, basically you can think of for people with heart failure with reduced eject fra ejection fraction, that heart is not able on its own to do what is needed to meet your body's needs. And so these medicines step in to help that heart function as it needs to. So it makes a change here and there, and then the heart function is able, the heart is fun able to function how it sh uh, basically should in a healthy heart. So um, yes, you should be on those medicines chronically because your heart will need it chronically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So those are the devices. And then we'll get into what you are all here doing, which is the cardiac rehab. Um, and we'll talk about the benefits of cardiac rehab and why it's a, a great thing you're doing it. So um, what cardiac rehab is, it involves a medical evaluation when you first start looking at your blood pressure, your vitals, several other things that are looked at, Edu <laughs> some education on medications and on heart disease. You know, talks like this are an example of that. Um, uh, recommendations, uh, dietary recommendations, we went into that when uh, I did the heart, uh, hypertension talk. Um, and then also the social support and the psychological support. A big thing about getting a diagnosis like heart failure um, or any other heart disease is that um, it really can be life-changing. And if people around you don't have it, that can be isolating. And so um, a kind of big benefit of being in cardiac rehab is connecting with other people who've gone through what you've gone through, 
who are experiencing what you are experiencing in terms of the mental health effects of having heart failure or of having had a heart attack, things like that. Um, and that support is really beneficial, creating that community of people that you have a lot in common with. And then um, the exercise training um, is really important, really beneficial for the heart. So that's everything you're doing in cardiac rehab. And so um, here's kind of the evidence that, that uh, supports why we recommend it and the benefits you get out of it. So there was a trial and this trial, the action trial was in people with pretty severe uh, heart failure. So that ejection fraction was 35 or less. Um, and so they looked at those who did a, tr uh, a cardiac rehab like training program versus those who didn't do anything. Um, and looking at it, the people who did the training program had reduced death from cardiovascular cause and they were hospitalized less for heart failure. So coming into cardiac rehab, we have some evidence, particularly in severe heart failure, that it'll keep you out of the hospital uh, and it may add years to your life based off this trial compared to doing nothing, no exercise training program. And then there are several uh, analyses done subsequently uh, that show a training program like cardiac rehab in heart failure uh, improves your functional capacity. So your ability to go about your daily life, groceries, errands, doing work around the house, people in programs like this, they're a lot better able to do that versus if you never did cardiac rehab. Um, you're able to exercise longer, so your cardiovascular endurance is better. Um, your quality of life is also a lot better. And again, we touched on that earlier, but you know, these medicines basically add years to your life, but something like cardiac rehab will make those years a lot better quality um, and a lot more enjoyable, uh, making you more able to do things that you enjoy doing outside of medicine and outside of cardiac rehab. Um, and then less hospitalizations for heart failure. Um, and I added that that's also true if you have preserved ejection fraction. So at the whole range of heart failures, not just severe heart failure, people in cardiac rehab ended up in the hospital less for their heart failure. Uh, I, I think we can all agree, you know, no one particularly wants to spend more time in a hospital than they need to. So doing something like this is a great way to keep you at home, keep you living your life and doing the things you enjoy. And so what can you uh, do uh, for your heart failure? One is to be aware of what the symptoms of heart failure are and to keep an eye out for those things. So again, symptoms of holding on to fluid, the things we talked about earlier, worsening shortness of breath, worsen lower leg swelling. Um, if you're not able to lay down flat without getting really short of breath, for example, uh, if your weight jumps up more than three pounds in a day or more than five pounds in a week, um, then that suggests maybe you're holding on to some fluid and we might want to increase a diuretic or one of your medicines with a diuretic effect. Uh, other, th other things uh, in your control to do would be exercising and cardiac rehab for all the benefits we just talked about. You know, this is a really important thing for all those reasons. And then following a low cell diet, I put an asterisk because we don't yet have the very best data on that, but what data we have so far suggests it's probably a good idea for people with heart failure to follow a low salt diet. Um, and so it's recommended less than one teaspoon in your diet. That's really challenging for people to do. So, you know, that's obviously like ideal, but if you can just do a relative reduction of one teaspoon, um, then that is beneficial. So that again, basically helps uh, to reduce that fluid retention and helps you feel a little bit better. So those are all the things you can do for your heart failure. Um, and these are my references for today's talk. Um, but that's kind of the thousand foot view of what heart failure is, what causes it, um, what you can do about it and why cardiac rehab is um, so great. Um, what questions do you have about things I talked about? Oh, I forgot already. You forgot already. <laughs> I should have had you write them all down. <laughs> Do you feel like it all made sense? Yeah? Feel like you have a better idea of what heart failure is? Uh, how, do you, how do you measure the uh, ejection fraction? With that echocardiogram, you can actually watch as the heart pumps out blood. 
Um, and there's more than one way to quantify that. And so we usually look at those several ways to quantify it and come up with that number. Well, I remember watching screen when it was done and pursued pictures and all kinds of stuff, and transportation type of stuff. Yeah. You said that you see it moving. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so the machine will give a number and then also uh, a trained and certified, usually cardiologist uh, by an echo society yeah. will do the final read and actually give the number. Yeah. One of the things that I was told that normal was between 55 and 70. Mm -hmm. I had a, but this says 50 to 70. Yeah, so there is some variation in how we define normal between 50 to 55%. So, um, you know, it's just a little bit gray, but in general, if you're in the 50s to 55s, you're considered to be on the low range of normal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, any questions about the medicines you're on for heart failure or, you know, Anything there? Anything you want to talk about? Things you've really enjoyed about cardiac rehab? Anything like that? <laughs> While we're here? <laughs> I have a problem with low blood pressure. Oh, yeah. Some days around. Yeah. I do dialysis. Mm -hmm. It gets sometimes dropped pretty low. Yeah. And particular when you have, you're doing dialysis, that's a pretty common thing that's going on. You have a lot of those fluid shifts going on. Um, but yeah, often it is a bit of a tightrope walk between these medicines that help your heart function get better, um, but they also lower your blood pressure a bit. And so sometimes people don't tolerate going so high on the medicines. And so that's kind of that, um, we just have to thread that needle most of the time with people. One day is fine, the next day is still down. Uh, yeah, exactly. And that can feel pretty crummy when your blood pressure is so low too, and we don't want that. So it's kind of, uh, something that you play by ear, person to person. Um, and yeah, one of the kind of, again, things we have to balance. Yeah. I don't suppose it's possible to go to an earlier slide. An earlier well, slide? I had questions on earlier slides, but. Oh, I can go back to earlier slides. Which one? Let's go. Places. What causes it? That was the first one. Right? Yes. What was it? Oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know when it was just waking up at night. Yeah. Is that at all similar to um, sleep apnea? Uh, it can be. And sometimes people say, yeah, I wake up in the middle of the night. And so it's up to the person who's kind of gathering your history to discern whether it's likely from holding on to fluid or it's likely from something else. So, yeah, these kind of symptoms and signs, you, we have to make sure it, it, it really is probably from the fluid retention because other things can cause some of these symptoms. But yes, you're, you're right. Uh, sleep apnea can make you wake up in the middle of the night. Um, and maybe with some shortness of breath, um, and so can holding on to fluid. And so when you see a provider, that's something that you basically were trained to discern. Okay. Yeah. And the, um, holding on to fluid. Mm -hmm. it, this, I've been told, you know, I have heart failure, and so I'm supposed to weigh myself every day, and I do. Um, but I have a very uh, fluctuating weight gain, weight loss. Yeah. And Does it still and jump three pounds in 24 hours sometimes? It has, a, you know, but then, then it'll start going down the next day. Yeah, so sometimes it, it's just, just like with the kind of uh, blood pressures going up and down. Um, similarly, you know, there can be some variation in weight. So usually you, ha again, get kind of the big picture of what's going on uh, to, to see whether we suspect you are holding on to fluid or maybe, you know, for one reason or another, you have rapid weight gain from other causes. Some metabolic things can cause rapid fluctuating weight gain, but it's basically we would just dig into 
w the pattern of weight gain you're having. Okay. With a um, a rate of, I don't know the word I want. Okay, I just I went to a function where I I know I ended up eating more salt. Oh, okay. Then would that do it? Yeah, would definitely. That yeah, definitely. Okay. Some people call in and they're like, I feel very bloated. And then, uh, and then you find out that they had a whole bunch of salt like the night prior. And often as your body kind of processes what you ate, um, you can get back to that baseline and feel better. Okay. So sometimes that really high level of salt intake can transiently um, cause you to feel bloated and have some mild food retention, but then it diminishes. Um, sometimes, you know, an increased dose of the diuretic may be needed, but again, kind of case by case. And then I think the last question I had, maybe, was um, I didn't see anything on there about um, the effects of smoking. Is that it? Is it yeah, so, or? yeah, this is kind of a thousand foot view, but smoking is definitely harmful, right? So smoking is going to uh, negatively cause what we call uh, atherosclerosis of the arteries. So um, uh, basically, hardening uh, and disease of your arteries and those arteries supply blood and oxygen to your heart and your body. So it's definitely going to affect the big picture in particular, usually it's going to affect your, your, the symptoms you're dealing with, whether that's shortness of breath, uh, whether it's arterial disease peripherally. Um, and so it's what we call a comorbidity. Um, the things that smoking tobacco can cause give you those comorbidities in people who also have heart failure. And it just kind of makes um, symptoms worse often, um, or if, for example, the cause of your heart failure is coronary artery disease, then smoking is something that you definitely should stop because that is really going to increase the risk of that plaque in the coronary arteries. So it's definitely recommended to quit smoking, uh, and that more ties to what specifically is causing the heart failure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a little off. Topic, but sure. With vaping, um, you see these giant clouds of smoke around these people, and, and I've always been curious: is, is is there some equivalent when you do one you hit of a vape versus mm. smoking a pack of cigarettes? Is there some sort of a, a comparison for what the damage is being done? Well, yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, it, yeah. It so right, exactly. Yeah. So the overall I think disposition is that it's probably not a great thing for your body uh, or a great habit, um, we, right? And so we don't really have as good of evidence as we do for tobacco smoking. There's more and more evidence coming out for different things that it's related to here and there. Um, for people who are vaping nicotine-containing substances, you know, that's recommended to try and taper off and eventually stop, um, you know, Nicotine can have some cardiac effects. Um, and so uh, it's just something that we recommend steering clear of. But in terms of your, you know, your question of, you know, a number equivalency, I'm not familiar with one. I'm not sure there is one quite yet, but just in general, tend to recommend uh, avoiding it if you can. Is it because it's a new thing? Because it, you haven't studied it exactly. So yeah, exactly. Because it's a new thing, Compared to tobacco and smoking tobacco, it's been around for a long, long time. So we've been able to see its negative consequences play out uh, and get you know high quality yeah. um, evidence, basically. Uh, whereas vaping, we're still gathering that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we've kind of covered that a bit. I hope you feel a little bit better informed about heart failure and a little more excited to do some cardiac rehab. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course. <laughs>